Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday q and I'm Eric Griffin, president of ITM Trading. With me, I have Lynette Zhang, our chief market analyst. For those of you who don't know or are tuning in for the first time, we take your questions that you submit to us via email to questions at itmtrading.com. We ask them, uh, put them up on a screen, ask them live so you get a real, true, organic response. <coughs> Excuse me. Okie doke. Mike G asks... How do you see pensions and social security payments being handled once the CBDCs roll out? Well, the reason, one of the reasons that they've stated that they're doing the CBDCs is because then they can eliminate checks and make it so much easier. Mm. So everybody will have an account with directly with the Fed and they will most likely push a button and that money will just be in your account. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they put a shelf life on that money or if they state where you can spend that money. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's, it'll just show up in your account. Don't you think that eventually that's, I mean, you pointed to it, but I think, I think we both agree, like, that's the end game, right? Is that the whole point of putting it there is to make it programmable, controllable, tell you when to spend, tell you what you can spend it on so that it gives full control, you know, under the guise of what's best for the economy, right? And right. controlling inflation and all the all the things that <laughs> they'll make it seem like they'll stress the benefits, but... Downplay the pitfalls. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, in their own words, the advantage for the government to have CBDCs is that they can do lifetime taxes because they'll see every single penny you make, they will mm -hmm. see every single penny you spend, and they can just pull those taxes right out whenever they deem that they want to. I mean, you'll probably have some level of notice. For the central banks right now, it takes about 18 months when they put a policy in place to work through the system to see whether or not it actually had the effect. But once we've got CBDCs and you're not spending, I mean, they would have real-time information on whether or not their policies were doing what they wanted them to do. So what they said is then it removes any limitations from how low they can push negative rates. In other words, eat up your principal. Now, you're sitting there and you're watching your bank account evaporate and you are not spending any money. What are you likely to do? Start spending. Exactly. And keep in mind this huge pattern shift, which has never historically happened, and, and particularly since you know they started transitioning us into a consumer in the U.S., uh, into a consumer-driven economy. They really started that in the 20s, ratcheted it up with uh, credit cards in the 50s. And in 59, they started tracking PCE, personal consumption expenditures, which is the Fed's preferred gauge for inflation. And when you look at those graphs on that piece that I just did on Thursday, so if you haven't watched that, you want to go back and watch that and, and look at it more than once. You know, see that pattern shift because it's so, it's obvious. It was like I was working on it because of the inflation and I went, oh my God, wow, this is a huge pattern shift on consumption. This is a consumption driven economy. And look at when you're online. I mean, the level of advertising that they're putting in your face is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it really is. I'm trying to work here and they keep throwing things in my face, trying to get me to stop working and go shopping. Doesn't work, but I could see how, how it might. But look at the shift in that. So once they have a CBDC, if you're not spending the way they want you to spend, they'll have the ability to force you to spend more. Mm -hmm. Boom. Full control. Yep. Full flipping control. That's right. why having physical <clears throat> gold and silver outside of the system is absolutely critical. If you want to have any level of privacy or any level of freedom. All right, so Bill R. asks, 
Why are silver stackers? I know you don't pay attention to this, right? I know you don't pay attention to the prices of things. Correct. That's not in your realm of research, but correct. Bill R is asking, why are silver stackers willing to pay twelve dollars over spot for a, basically a twenty twenty two American silver eagle? Now, Nor- normal normal market right would be probably three to four dollars over spot. Currently, I looked today and we were at for a 2022 somewhere on average around $15 over spot for a 2022 Silver Eagle. Hmm. Well, my guess would be that because it's reflecting a true supply demand market and there's a lot more demand than there is supply. Correct. It's interesting too, I've seen a bunch of people in the comments recently saying like, that the dealers are charging, um, you know, twenty percent over a spot, and I, I wanted to uh, point a clarification here that we're not, and no dealer is charging. Well, I can't say no dealer because I can't speak for everybody, but um, is charging twenty percent over spot. Uh, that that supply and demand factor that you're speaking of, it trickles from all the way from the manufacturers down to the people who mint the coins. And if it's the U.S. Mint, then it's the U.S. Mint's charging more. Then it goes mm-hmm. to the dis- distribution channels and they're charging more. So it's the entire supply chain is is factored into that 14 or $15 over spot price. It's not, the dealers aren't determining that they're gonna charge that because then all, all that would happen is one, uh, couple of dealers out there would just undercut it and then no one would buy from anybody it's no one would buy from the people who are charging 14 or 15 over because there's people out there charging four over so that that price actually gets dictated all the way through the supply chain down to the dealer so um so i wanted that to be clear to everybody like if you see a price on the internet on somebody's website and it's high but you go to another website, it's high. You go to another website, it's high. It's because it's throughout. It's the supply and demand fundamentals that is creating that price discrepancy. And and we were, I think, we, gosh, when was the last time you and I talked about this? Because we talked about premiums, right? Right. We've and ta- the premiums right. are always expanding and shrinking, especially in this market right now. I mean, 2012 to 2018, we really didn't see much difference in the in the premium. It was constantly really in that low one spot but now we're seeing it increase decrease increase decrease quite regularly and the more that there the more the demand is the tighter the supply gets the more the premiums are going to push up right and and you know let, let's keep in mind too because people look at spot and they think oh well that's how much gold and silver are worth mm-hmm. and that's not really true that is a contract price for it depends because they're different size contracts, but five th- typically 5,000 ounces of silver, 500 ounces of gold. And it doesn't cost very much to create a whole bunch of paper gold and paper silver. So it makes it look like there's a whole lot more of it than it is. Mm-hmm. Don't be fooled by that because neither one of those spot prices reflect the true fundamental value. And ultimately, when, I mean, I learned a lot from my Uncle Al. But one thing 100% in the physical world, 100% of the time, things always go from undervaluation to fair valuation to overvaluation to fair valuation to undervaluation in a constant loop. And if it's in the physical world, it doesn't go to zero unless maybe if it's for a rock or, you know, some it's a fad. But on anything like gold or silver or fine antiques or fine jewelry or fine whatever, you know, you always have that infinity pattern. Now, intangible assets, that's completely different. Those can and do go to zero frequently. But when you're in the tangible world, there are, you know, there's more utility and therefore there's more buyers depending upon what it is. And Bill, to answer your question in a different way too, if you're if you're liquidating, I didn't. I should have done that before I came into this Q and A. Was look at what what is the current market bid price bid. for a mm-hmm. silver eagle because it's much higher now. If you were to liquidate your, if you had a 
monster box of silver eagles and you went to sell it right now into the market, you're going to get a lot more than what you would normally get for a premium um, over spot in a normal market, right? If if the spot market is getting, you know, you're buying for four dollars over spot in a normal market, and maybe you're getting a dollar over spot for when you sell it. Right now, it's probably excess of six or seven or eight dollars, if I had to guess. It might even be more than that for a uh, 2022 Silver Eagle. So you're actually getting more in this market too. The the premiums right. on the on, you know, are are rising on the bid and the ask. Yeah. All right, so Jen L asks, I believe that we are headed to central bank digital currencies and a one world currency central government. If we all have to use their CBDCs, how, A, how can we convert our gold, right? B, what if they ban us from converting gold into CBDCs? What if the government shuts down gold dealers and says they're no longer allowed to buy gold? Can this happen? If so, what will we do to prepare for that? Well, that that is really let's let's take one piece of that at a time. And uh, but a great question, Jen. Um, I agree with you that we are headed to a CBDC, not necessarily a one wall currency central government. And the reason why I don't think that we're going to have, I, I, we're at least it won't appear to be that way. It could very well be that way right now, uh, but. They need to keep the new currency as close to normal, as close to what people are used to as possible to get the fastest and easiest adoption. You can take a look at what happened with China, and China has the ability to force the population to adopt. And, you know, they, they've had a bit of a hard time with that, even so. So they need to keep the currency as close to what we're used to as possible. So my bet is that we're going to end up with the IMF's digital SDR as the world reserve currency, because that's a basket of currencies. And then every country will have a local CBDC. So we'll have the digital dollar, the digital yuan, the digital euro, et cetera. So I think that's more likely than just one big one because everybody would know and they would get a lot of pushback. So if we have, if we all have to use our CBDC, how can we convert our gold? And that goes back to like we would convert, if you were selling the gold back to us, we would convert it into whatever the local barterable legal tender currency is. So that really wouldn't probably change from what we're already doing. That right, would be if, the same. If it was a CBDC, we'd sell it. We'd give it to you in the central bank digital currency because we'll all be forced to be using it. Exactly. Now, what if they ban us from converting gold to CBDCs, which is a possibility. Um, I can't say that they won't do that because that's certainly far beyond my pay grade, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but would you like to add something well, don't, to that? So don't you think, too, like, I, I would I would guess, and this is a question for you, I would guess that if they, they wouldn't necessarily ban it from converting gold into a CBDC, I would say that they would do what they've done in the past historically, which is go to a confiscation thing and then make it illegal to own. Right. And then you would, con you would essentially then convert it. You would basically be giving it to the government, and then they would be converting it into you a would central be giving bank them digital the currency. Gold. Right. You would give them the gold, they would convert it into a central bank digital currency at whatever the set price was, and then rather than just banning you from converting it, then they can control the asset, right? Exactly. Yes, thank you for that because you're absolutely right. I mean, their, their goal would be to get all the gold. So, yes. Um, and what if the government sh shuts down? This goes back to your same answer. What if the government shuts down gold dealers and says they're, they are no longer able to buy? Well... Can this happen? Anything can happen, so I can't say yes or no. And how would we prepare for that? Well, frankly, that's why I only buy collectible gold, because it is in a different classification. Because remember, when they do some, even if you listen to what's happening right now, when a government wants to punish you, they don't want to make it harder on themselves. 
right? They just want to punish you. So making monetary gold illegal, like they've done historically in the past and even recent in other countries, um, yeah, that, that's the most likely outcome from that. And so if you have collectible gold and it's in a different category, then you'll still have that as a good currency to use, a tool to barter with, which you could either convert into the CBDCs and use the CBDCs, or in some cases, possibly even making that transaction directly, gold for whatever it is that you're buying. Right, and where, where Lynette gets this from, for those of you who haven't been watching our channel forever, because um, <clears throat> we do talk about this on a somewhat regular mm -hmm. basis, but um, the kind of the precedent that we use is what was said in 1933, which is gold coins that are rare and unusual or have special value to collectors, those type of gold coins were exempt from the confiscation in 1933. So that's when she says, I want to, you know, I buy collectibles because we know that historically they've been safe in the past. Doesn't guarantee that in the future that they will be, right. but like eminent domain laws like we've talked about in the past kind of make it more difficult because by law they have to give you what is the current market value for something that they're going to take. Like if they're going to take your land to build a freeway, they have to give you the, the appropriate... Fair value. Exactly. So um, that's, that's the reason why we, and I'm the same. I, this exact type of gold that I buy too, because it's the safest. It's the safest, right? And there's and it has and back to the premium question, right? Is the premiums on those fluctuate differently? That's totally driven by supply and demand. So while some of the coins will value will be derived by whatever the spot price is, if supply gets tight and demand gets really hot and people are trying to buy a bunch of it, then the premiums go up. So right. maybe instead of 30 or 40% over spot as a value, it jumps to 80% or 240% over spot we've seen before. So there, there's extra benefit in there that's layered in there as well. Right, and, and I just mm -hmm. wanna to add too, when they did that back in 33, another piece of it is they wanted to be able to continue to buy and hold gold without oversight because there were jewelry dealers, et cetera, et cetera, but those all had to report. There was oversight with them. So, I mean, can that, can that be different this time? Sure it can. Who can guarantee that? That's beyond, but it's not likely to. So just as a general rule of thumb, and this is, I don't feel the same way about silver regarding that, but you look at what you what the government classifies as monetary gold, and that's easy. Just look at the kind of gold you can hold inside of an IRA. So I do not buy the kind of gold that you can hold inside of the IRA, period. Because that's easy for them to confiscate inside of the IRA. But it's also, um, that, that really tells you what their definition is of monetary gold. Yeah, and if you ever have, if any of you guys ever have questions about this, it's one of the things that we, when we talk about the strategy, every single type of gold and silver has its place right. in your overall goals and objectives. It's just a matter of what are you trying to accomplish and what's right for you. And, and people, you know, say, what's the minimum I should have? Well, you know. Depends. Totally depends. <laughs> what are your right. goals and objectives? What's your concerns? What are you preparing for? So on and so forth. So you can always schedule a call with one of our experts here and, you know, anytime and get the get the advice that you need. Have that, yeah, have that conversation. And it's an important conversation <laughs> to have sooner than later. All right, so Reagan B. asks, thank you for your stellar work, oh, Lynette. Thank you. You're Knowing welcome. about the plan for the CBDCs coming, how specifically can we avoid it? Is there a workaround? I have gold, I have silver, I have Bitcoin. I also have property that's becoming more and more sustainable. How can we specifically avoid CBDCs? There, you know, if we can come together in community before these are put in place, maybe we have a shot. But I'm, I'm pretty certain that this is the future of money. Mm -hmm. So the only way that you can specifically avoid it is like I uh, talked about, where you don't convert your gold and silver once, all at once. You kind of hold it back and. Because there is, there's different kinds of gold and different kinds of silver based upon the function of what you're trying to accomplish. 
But the only way really to avoid it, the only workaround is to not put everything you have into CBDCs. That, that's how you do it. So, you know, for me, part of it is in the um, legacy kind of gold coins that I anticipate where the goal is just to pass them down through generation and generation, kind of like the Queen of England, right? You look at the wealth that has lasted in families at least 300 years, and they're all hard assets. Gold, real estate, rare collectibles. That's how you get a, and how many, how many currency crises has England had in the last thousand years, do you think? That's how you get around it. You hold a good, high quality, hard assets, physical gold, because when you hold it, you own it. If you don't hold it, you don't own it, regardless of your perception. I personally cannot think of, um, any, any other way to avoid it. I'm, I'm really happy, Reagan, that you have such a nice diversified portfolio and you have that and you're more and more sustainable. That's excellent. That's how you avoid it. You're doing the right things. All right, so George K asks, how much time do we have to pay off our variable rate date debt, such as a credit card, before hyperinflation becomes too high for us to pay it off? As soon as possible, George because we're already watching raising rates and um, that's, you know, that's not going to be stopping anytime soon, especially when the Fed attempts to run off their balance sheet, which they're now saying to the tune of, of what, almost a trillion dollars a month, 950 billion a month. Are no flipping way. Yeah. A trillion a month. Yeah. Oh no flipping way are they. That's craziness. I, you want to engineer a soft landing? <laughs> I oh mean, God. I hate to say it, but it's it's almost laughable what they're talking about doing, you know, half of uh, 50 basis points a month and then running off their balance sheet to almost a trillion dollars a month. It ain't going to happen. I'm telling you right now. They, they may do it one time. <laughs> But do you realize what the markets, how the markets would respond? They even, there's even been a bill submitted. I was, I was hearing this as I was driving into the office today where they're just going to take the Fed down to one mandate and that is to fight inflation. Yeah. You mean the inflation that they created with all the money printing and the easy money policies and interest rates nailed at zero and all the more debt that, that has been grown that now has to be rolled over and will be rolled over at higher rates already? So it, it's, it's, it's a joke. I mean, it is seriously, there's, there's no way they can do it. I'll go on record saying mm, they'll try it once. Well, and they're going down a path. Central bank digital currencies will be a solution to solve the problem. Don't believe it. Until they put a component of gold inside of the new currency to get your confidence again, don't believe it. It is not the solution because they don't change behavior. No. They just double down on their well, behavior. It's ridiculous. Even if they put in a component of gold, it's not going to change their behavior. Well, no, a component perception. of, well, because they no. can manipulate that component of gold, right? Well, they, they can and change they'll start to do that, right? And they'll start to do that. And then they're not going to go to 100% backing. No, but they'll, they'll go to whatever level they feel will garner enough confidence, public confidence to use the currency again. But remember that, that on average, so I can't say how many times this is going to happen, but on average, they do three overnight revaluations because they do one, they say, okay, this is going to fix it. And somehow people believe them. I don't know why, but somehow people believe them, right? Until very quickly they find out, oh, that didn't really, ch that didn't stop the inflation. It didn't change anything. My circumstances are getting worse and worse and worse, right? But somehow, I mean, actually, I, I had a client years ago 
years ago who had worked for a Delta and had his pension basically demolished uh, and given to the PBGC or whatever. He, that happened to him three times. Three times, three different airlines. He's a pilot. And yet, when I talked about the possibility of that happening to him again, he couldn't believe it. I said, but you've already experienced it three times. How can you sit there and say this could not possibly happen again? Right? I, I don't get it. I, to this day, I don't understand that. Must be some good perception managers. <laughs> yes. Yes, and that's the trouble with the currencies, right? What did they knew? No, they knew two key things. They knew many other things, but they knew two key things. They knew that people marry the legal money of the state. And they also know that people do not understand inflation. Not one man in a million. So they use those numbers. People get blinded by numbers. Right, and they use that and they rob you, absolutely rob you until you end up with nothing. So, you know, variable rate debt, we said we were gonna watch what's going on with the interest rates, they're spiking. You wanna get out of your vi variable rate debt as quickly as you can. All right, well, that's it for today. Oh, amazing. Well, if you haven't done this already, and I really hope that you have, but if you haven't, you need to get your strategy in place so you can survive and, dare I say it, even come out the other side of this mess better than you're entering it. And so you need to start your gold and silver strategy, and you can click that Calendly link below and talk to one of our experts, and they'll help put together a strategy based on your goals. So have in mind, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. These are my goals. And, and sometimes that's hard to do. They'll walk you through it with questions so that you can solidify and define what your goals are and then get your strategy implemented as quickly as possible. But if you like this, please leave us a thumbs up. Make sure that you leave a comment and share this video with everybody and anybody that you can think of that you care about. I mean, it's critical that everybody understand what's going on these days. And so with that, I'm going to say, please, please be safe out there because it's getting more and more dangerous. It is. It just is. And until next we meet, bye-bye.